Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Leadership Boy Podcast. I'm Enrique with my co-host, Vince, to bring you the best in our veteran, military spouse, and first responder community. And Vince will introduce today's special guest. Amen for that. I am super excited, fired up. General retired Dave Goldfein. He is from Bernie, Texas, who served last as the 21st Chief of Staff of the Air Force. We are honoring the United States Air Force 76th birthday with this gentleman here. So let's start off. General, tell us a little bit about you. Well, first, uh, Vince, you know, you know, if uh, if you watched, you know, Top Gun Maverick, right? And Enrique, this is a pitch to your Navy background, right? So, you know, every fighter pilot has a call sign, right? Or a nickname. Uh, I got a new one when I retired. I actually have, I, I now go by J JD, which stands for just Dave. No general, no chief, no sir, none of that. So you know, say it three times, it'll actually become real easy. Uh, but uh, yeah, I couldn't be proud to be here with you and, and focus on our veterans, our families. And so thanks to both of you uh, and to Triple Nickel uh, for everything that you do you know, for that group. Uh, just a couple of things I'll share. I'm, uh, I'm married to my high school sweetheart. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary. Uh, and we are also the proud parents of two wonderful daughters who married their Aggie sweethearts and then uh, produced the most beautiful four grandchildren, three granddaughters and one grandson. Uh, they don't know it yet, but they're class of, you know, 2040 and 2043 at the Air Force Academy. You know, I'll let them decide whether it's Air Force or Space Force, but uh, that's the most important thing about me. My call sign is just Dave, and or if you're a, grand, a grandchild, it's Papa. It's so good to have you in the show. And we wanted to ask you, in the U.S. Air Force, you definitely learn, not only as a young officer, but as a senior officer, some great things. So what pivotal leadership moments did you learn the most from in the Air Force? Well, you know, I'd say one of the things that, uh, that taught me a lot, first of all, I, I like so many senior, successful senior officers, uh, was raised by great NCOs. So first, thanks to both of you and all the NCOs out there who are, you know, <clears throat> raising young officers. And, uh, and one of the things that they taught me uh, is leadership is really truly a gift. And it's a gift that's offered by those who are privileged to serve as leaders. And it's a gift that you have to re earn and re-earn every single day in how you act, in the decisions you make, and how you represent the, the position you're privileged to fill at the time. And you, know, you build trust and confidence you know, every single day uh, you're in the position, but it can be lost in a second of indiscretion, of, of a, a character failure. And so, you know, anybody who believes that they're entitled to the perks of senior leadership, right? Uh, and doesn't believe that they ought to be earning that gift every single day uh, is, is potentially off the tarmac and on the dirt path. And the ones who truly are, you know, on this journey, like we're, we're all on, I don't know about you guys, but I'm still working on it to become the inspirational servant leader I want to be. And I think once we, you know, if we ever get to a point where we plant the flag and feel like we arrived, it's probably about time to retire. <laughs> earn and re-earn leadership every day, every hour. It's so amazing. I love hearing that pivotal leadership impactful moment. So, also, would love to hear in your 37 vast career in the United States Air Force, who was instrumental, who impacted you while you served? Well, I'll start off with uh, some, you know, some great senior NCOs, some chiefs. You know, chiefs have a way of talking to folks that uh, there's a code, right? And you guys, you know this code, right? Same probably code in the, in the Navy, Enrique, right? And uh, it starts with a few words. Uh, Sir, with all due respect, <laughs> right? And then... After that, you know something good's coming, right? You better pay attention. So, you know, I'll just tell you a couple stories, right? So, you know, my first chief was a guy named Jimmy Kelly, just a great uh, senior NCO. And he, you know, stuck his head in one day and said, hey, sir, you got a minute? And uh, 
you know, the answer to that question, of course, with your chief is always absolutely chief. Come on in. He walked in and he put a box on my desk. He looked at it and he says, you know, that ought to make you mad because it makes a lot of your airmen mad. And I looked at it. I picked it up. I, I looked at it. I said, man, I don't, I'm not getting it. Chief, what are, you, what are you trying to teach me here? He goes, well, sir, read the box. And I read it and it said, Johnson and Johnson, flesh colored mandates. And I said, uh, okay, chief, man, I ain't getting it. He goes, well, let me show you. And uh, he ripped a bandaid open, you know, put this pink bandaid on his, you know, African-American skin and said, that ought to make you mad because it makes a lot of your airmen mad. And he winked and he walked out. So what was the lesson? I couldn't see it. Right. So, you know, every room I've walked into my entire life has been full of people look, look like me, right. Systems I competed in were built by people that look and sound like me, right. For people that look and sound like me. And so my life experience had produced blinders. And no matter how long I looked at that box, there was no way I would have seen what he was teaching me. And so I share that story because those are the lessons, the leadership lessons, right? And when for me, it was this acknowledgement that I had blinders on. And if I was going to see what was going on in the organizations I was privileged to lead, I had to surround myself with people who could see what I couldn't see. That had life experiences that were different than mine. I've, I've never been the only woman in a room who has everything I say scrutinized to a different level who you know who who've had people say things they think are funny but actually are quite degrading I've, that's not been my life experience i've never been the only african american the only asian american i've never been that person in the room that's not been my part of my life experience and so if i so if i surround myself with a team that looks you know exactly like me um i'm not going to be an effective leader of a diverse organization so that's just one of the many stories I can tell you about, you know, senior NCOs that, you know, taught me so, you know, really important lessons along the way. An absolute powerful moment there because I'm hearing you and I'm like, wow, I would have never thought, right, of that specific thing didn't happen to me, but I can also acknowledge the fact that, yeah, I would have been thinking a little different <laughs> had I been on that end, uh, but very powerful. And thank you for sharing that. Now, when it comes to the Air Force and the future, I'm sure we all have our perspectives, but what are your thoughts regarding the future of the Air Force? And you mentioned Space Force. I'm happy that your family member has two options now <laughs> for yeah. their future. But what do you think about the future of the U.S. Air Force? So I'll, I'll, I'll share with you my, my personal journey uh, with the Space Force. So I started being quite concerned, and you can go back and see the original testimony where I was quite concerned about the business of separating space in the joint fight, because the traditional model in the Pentagon for any bureaucracy, when you're starting something new and building a new organization, is you do two, three things very quickly. You build a castle, you dig a moat, and you fill it with dragons. And you do that because you got to defend yourself against everybody else who's coming after your money. It's the just typical bureaucracy, right? And I'd gone out to a red flag, which is our you know uh, highest end large force exercise. And I watched, uh, I watched the, the the deployed Air Expeditionary Wing Commander at the time, Colonel Deanna Burt, who was the wing commander at Schriever. And she's a Space Force officer now, three-star. And she was the deployed commander. And every uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, every unit that deployed to that red flag reported to her. And she was responsible for the blue side of the campaign. Such was the nature of joint integration. Space was part of everything we did. And in the business of separating space, I was concerned that we were going to separate, you know, a separate service was going to separate space from the joint war fight. Then I went down to, I went down to Maxwell and I sat down with our Schriever scholars, some young Lieutenant colonels we had sent down there for school. And I'm telling them my thinking and I could tell from the body language, they weren't buying it. And so I finally, as you often do as a leader, 
decided to stop transmitting and start squinting with my ears. And I said, okay, diga me. You got me captured. Talk to me. Tell me, tell me what you're thinking, because I can tell you all I ain't buying my pitch. And so we had a chuckle and then they started telling me. And I said, all right, how many of you show of hands believe we need to set it, you know, stand up space as a separate service? Every hand went up. And these are my airmen. So I acknowledged and said, okay, I'm going to go do a campaign of learning. And so I visited every space force base. I went and talked to industry, went and talked to NASA, went and talked to, you know, uh, a, a lot of folks. And, and I had two fundamental questions. Could we as a service embrace space superiority with the same passion that we have historically embraced air superiority? And number two, could I as a service chief advance space given all that was going on in industry and NASA? Could I advance it given all the things that were on my plate as fast as a service chief singularly focused on space? And when I came to my, I came to my own conclusion that uh, we could do it better with a separate service. And I shared that with the president, former president. So that was my journey. And then when I, when I would talk to groups, I would hold up this great picture I had of my two granddaughters at the time, uh, Ava and Ray. And I would, I would show everybody the picture and I'd say, you know, this is Ava and Ray. They're a class of 2040 at the Air Force Academy. They don't know that yet. One of them will join the Air Force, one of them will join the Space Force, and on that day of their graduation, uh, there will be a test question. And the test question is for us today. And the question is, what did we build? Did we build two services based on a foundation of trust and confidence that is so integrated that space is central to the joint war fight? Or did we build castles, moats, and dragons? And are we now defending ourselves against each other as opposed to completely integrated, focused on trust? That's the test question. So uh, that was my journey. And so when you ask the future of the service, I will tell you uh, too early to tell in terms of what we're building. But the class of 2020 will get the, tw the test question. Absolutely, indeed. Love these powerful stories you're sharing, General. They're amazing. It kind of reminds me, makes me back to the box of Johnson & Johnson, right? You, you had to really squint your ears and listen to those uh, in the service, and they all shared the same sentiment that, yes, it should be separate. But And here we are. The test of time will truly determine how valuable, as we all know, it is valuable, the Space Force. But thank you for sharing the future the story about the United States Air Force and your two grandchild will be in separate uh, entities in the United States Air Force and the Space Force. Now, I'd love to share your leadership uh, aha pearls of wisdom that you have had in your time in your Air Force career. Which are those? We'll love to hear those. Well, you know, maybe I share a couple of, again, you can obviously tell I'm a storyteller. Uh, so, uh, so first, you know, I, I guess the thesis I would offer to you is that Great leaders are on a journey that never ends, that continues to focus on inspirational servant leadership, that never takes for granted that the position that we're privileged to fill requires us to act in a certain way. And we cannot, we cannot confuse character and reputation. Reputation is what people think of us after they've watched us act, you know, in a position for some long period of time. Character is about how we live our lives and the decisions we make when no one's watching. If we focus on character, reputation will actually take care of itself. If we reverse that, we can get it wrong. And the American people have every right to demand in equal parts of their leaders, character and competence. There was a time when I was director of the joint staff working for uh, then, you know, the chairman, General Marty Dempsey, and, and, and he asked me a question. He says, hey, have we, have we got the balance wrong? We've been at war now for at the time 15 years. And is it possible that we're rewarding 
uh, performance in a way that we're rewarding competence and overlooking character flaws. And this was after we'd come out of some pretty tragic situations like you may remember uh, the Abu Ghraib uh, experience we had, remember that? Um, we'd had you know, an issue with the Sergeant Bales you know, uh, in Afghanistan. We'd had, some, we'd had some situations where we clearly did not have our values with us in conflict, but yet we were getting the mission done. And so we went back and took a look across the services and we came to the conclusion that we had gotten the balance off a bit and we needed to recorrect. And so all the services took this on. You know, we can never forget as a service, you know, um, uh, Jeff Bezos one time, he told me, he goes, Dave, you know, he, is, he says, the reason the United States military is held up in such high regard is that you've become known as an institution that does really hard things really well. And over and over again, you do the hardest of things really well. And the hardest thing that we could ever ask a young person to do is to, to, to be part of a, the, the, you know, humanity's greatest tragedy, which is war. But sometimes it has to happen. And so we can never forget that, that we take our values with us when we go to war. And the story that I always reflect on when I was the Air Component Commander and Central Command, Air and Space Component Commander, you know, Bagram Air Base fell, fell under me. And, I'm, uh, and I remember uh, going to the uh, hospital at Bagram and we had just had a mass casualty event. And the first thing I saw was the line of folks lined up as far as you could see to give blood. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, civilians, uh, active guard, reserve, civilian, contractors, Afghans, everyone lined up. And so I went into the, the operating room, the OR, and they, they actually you know, let me scrub up and go in just to help motivate the, the surgical teams that were operating you know, in a frenzy to save life and limb. And in one room, and every room was double stuffed, meaning you had two surgical teams, two beds, two victims, or two individuals who were, who were uh, you know, fighting for their lives. In one room, parked head to head, was the shooter and his victim. And these two surgical teams are operating with equal passion to save life and limb for not only our troop, but the Taliban who shot him, who does that? And the answer is we do. We take our values with us when we go into conflict. It's what separates us. And so uh, this journey to inspirational leadership, servant leadership is a journey that I don't think ever ends. A very powerful story of how someone can take values into even the most adverse and and you know hard to swallow moments as war and as war fighters we know we've witnessed or we've partaken or we supported uh wartime efforts uh, but what a wonderful scene not the fact that people were injured but that that surgical team with the same passion and love and, and compassion for life could work on either spectrum of that situation, uh, such a, such a powerful, uh, reflection and, and story share. Thank you for that. Now you mentioned your granddaughters, you mentioned young airmen that we asked to go, you know, do this hard thing. So what leadership tips or advice for upcoming men and women entering the military can you share today? You know, the, you know, in a simple way you could divide the, divide uh, each nation into three groups. And this is, this is, I'll tell you up front, this is rather simplistic, but it does, you know, pre present the visual that's helpful. So there, I call it sheep, wolves, and sheep dogs, right? So sheep um, represent, let's just say the American people, you know, fathers, sons, daughters, mothers, cousins, brothers, and sisters, right, in, in hometown America, wherever that may be. And they're focused on all the things that make America great, right? 
faith, family, friends, the economy, business, church, school, roads, grounds. And that's what we want them focused on. Uh, what we don't want them focused on is being attacked in their hometown as we were on 9-11. And unfortunately, we wish it weren't so, but there is evil in the world and those are the wolves. And wolves exist for a certain one purpose, and that is to kill the sheep. And given an opportunity, they will kill as many as they can. And so who stands between the sheep and the wolves? And the answer is the sheep dogs. This is the young men and women who, who stand, raise their right hand, take an oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And, and I'm one that believes that every, every generation is the greatest generation. And the, and the young people that I had a pleasure of serving with and serving as chief are as good as any generation who's ever, you know, stepped up, right? I remember, you know, I, when I left as chief, 97% um, uh, of the Air Force had never known a day of peace. Their entire careers, we had been at war. And so when they joined, they joined for in a completely different environment than when I joined. When I joined, it was post-Vietnam. We weren't at war anywhere, right? And there was nothing on the horizon. So my motivations were perhaps a little bit different than today's young soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman who joined knowing full well that they may deploy into combat at any given time. They're, that we should not ever question their patriotism, their courage, and their ability to, to lead and do those hard things that the nation expects us to do really well. So, you know, my message to young, our young folks is uh, thank you to them and their families for stepping up and being the sheep, sheep dogs that the nation needs and the nation deserves. So they can focus on Americana and we can focus on making sure that they're safe. Totally understand and appreciate those two words. And one in, in Spanish is one word, gracias, right? So thanking the generations because they are the greatest generations coming above, above and beyond. So I love the stories, everything you shared. The 76th Air Force's birthday is here. We are honored to have cosine JG, JD in the house, but it's actually General Retired Dave Goldfein. So thank you for being here. How do people get a hold of you, sir? Uh, so probably the easiest way is, uh, so my, my trip planner when I was chief was a guy named Buck Holloway. And uh, I called Buck, uh, I think you both have worked with him. I called Buck and said, hey, Buck, uh, you know, I have no idea what I'm going to do in this next chapter. I just know I could use, sure use your help. And so he's joined me on this journey as my executive assistant and one of my best friends. And he's great. So uh, Buck is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, because uh, he, he, quite frankly, I would get rid of half of my portfolio if it wasn't for him. And so, you know, if you want to share his contact info with anybody, that'd be just fine. Absolutely, folks. And we will have that information as part of the show notes and video so you can get a hold of Buck. Uh, he does a great job indeed. And if you want to get a hold of us at the Leadership Void podcast, the Leadership Void at gmail.com is where you'll send that correspondence. If you want to see a specific speaker or a leadership topic covered, that you can do it through those means. Absolutely. And as you know, today is all about the 76th Air Force birthday. But we have today also, guess what? From our sponsors, we have a former commander of the Triple Nickel, which is actually Dave Goldfinger. So that's amazing in itself. And not sure if you had something to share, but we're honored to have them, Favov and VEI, sponsoring our show. But today was all about... Uh, General Retired David Goldfein, and we are honored to have J.D. in the house, our 21st Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, but celebrating our 76th birthday. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. So, you know, the coolest thing about the Triple Nickel was uh, not that I got to command it, but my father flew in it. Uh, he was a flight commander in the Triple Nickel when it was in uh, in flying in Vietnam. And so to be you know, second generation uh, was really pretty exciting. 